الثانيه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله in the name of Allah the most compassionate the most merciful all praise and it belongs to Allah Almighty and peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam before we start I would like to thank uh, the <coughs> Cardiff University the center for uh, the study of Islam in the UK uh, Professor Sophie Dr Mansoor who I know Dr Mansoor Ali for inviting me uh, and giving me the opportunity to be here today with you and share some words some ideas some thoughts and I would like to thank all of you as well for taking out your precious time and attending this this uh, lecture or discussion the topic is actually a very important topic a very maybe sensitive topic shall we say the role as uh, sophie's just said role of a mufti inverted commas in the modern society uh, in in the west uh, in the 21st century i want to touch upon a few points five or six different points uh, if i can fit all of them in hopefully by the will of Allah uh, and then inshallah we can um, take some questions and maybe have some discussion the word mufti as many of you may have previously come across the word mufti is used in collaboration with another term on a regular basis which is fatwa yes uh, Muslims know about fatwa many non-Muslims actually Maybe the first time they heard of the word fatwa was when the whole Salman Rushdie affair came about. For some, the word fatwa is uh, associated with the fatwa of killing somebody or shooting someone or murder. It's like the, the fatwa that came out. So when that word is sometimes heard, uh, sometimes not knowing the reality of that term or that phrase or that word, uh, it can bring about some misconceptions. So I want to talk about the word fatwa and then the word mufti and a few other similar um, aspects. <clears throat> the word fatwa in Arabic, which is a religious verdict, it's actually an Arabic term. It's not an English term, it's an Arabic term. Also, another term used is futya. It exactly means the same thing, fatwa and futya. Uh, which is a singular word in Arabic. The plural is fatawa. So, or in English, people like to just put the S at the end and say fatwas. But really, the correct Arabic term is fatawa or fatawi. Basically refers to a unbinding religious ruling, religious ruling a non-binding religious ruling. Why I say non-binding is because when somebody issues a fatwa, Basically, that person, he or she, is providing the questioner with a ruling from an Islamic religious perspective and point of view. But that view that is provided by the scholar, by the imam, or by the mufti, or by the muftiya, because for the female version of a mufti is muftiya, we don't only have a mufti, we can also have a mufti, of course, which I may talk about if we have time. Uh, that ruling is basically an advice, which is, of course, non-binding. The person leaves your office as a mufti or a muftiya and walks out the door. And then whether that person acts upon that non-binding ruling or not, this has nothing to do with the person who gave the ruling. The person came himself or herself, or the person phoned and asked the question, wanted clarification. The religious advice was being provi was provided, and then it's between them and their God and their Lord and their own life, and between them and in their privacy, privacy, sorry, whether they act upon it or not. So this is why we say it's a non-binding religious ruling. And linguistically, the word fatwa means, in Arabic, it's a answer response to any question it doesn't even have to be religious based 
So if somebody asks me, where is the Millennium Stadium from here? So if I tell that person the Millennium Stadium is whatever, whatever, uh, which is not too, too far away. We actually went close to the Millennium Stadium, just had a quick look from outside. I've actually been before there, but my colleague hadn't seen it, so uh, I wanted to show it to him. Um, that, as a, from a linguistic point of view, a fatwa, that would be a fatwa, directions, you know, giving a response to anything. Um, that's why if you see in the Quran, there are, wor there are verses where the word fatwa is used in a non-religious sense. So for example, um, uh, Yusuf, peace be upon him, when he was in the prison, he was asked by some of his colleagues, and the Quran talks about this and says, uh, relates what the person said, Yusuf ayyuhu siddiqu aftina fi sab'i baqarat. He's actually asking him about a dream that he had. So he said, tell me. So the word used about telling me, he said, Aftina, give me a fatwa, basically tell me, inform me. So from a linguistic, Arabic linguistic point of view, the word fatwa is like an answer to any, any question. But then, of course, it became specifically, and the word fatwa technically refers to a non-binding ruling, as I just mentioned, and it is a answer provided for a religious-based question. A lot of the times we hear the term legal, you know, uh, the legal ruling. Well, when, I, when we say legal, and maybe I may use that term legal uh, in today's discussion, we mean legally meaning Islamically, because legally here in this context is legally by law of the country. So I, I actually avoid using the term legally. This is a legal, legal ruling pro provided, because a legal ruling is a, a, a UK-based law ruling. So we would say an Islamic ruling. So it is a fatwa is a response to a question which is a which is to do with any matter of a of faith. So the person who is following the faith, which is of course the Islamic faith in this in this context, if somebody uh, comes to a mufti, seeks clarification, advice, wants an answer about any matter of deen. Now, matters of deen, because Islam is a comprehensive way of life, and there's aspects, different aspects of a person's life that they need advice and guidance. So that question may be to do with, number one, creed, aqidah. So somebody might come to a mufti and ask about his belief system. What do I believe? Do I need to, what are the attributes of God? Or what do I believe about the hereafter? Or what do I need to know about hellfire? Or what do I need to, I should have said paradise first. Uh, what do I need to know about paradise, or what, I, what do I need to know about angels? Anything to do with the matters of creed, or worship, prayer. People regularly ask about prayer, fasting, whether it's charity, whether it's hajj, whether it's business and commerce and trade and finance, whether it's marriage, whether it's divorce, whether it's about inheritance. Any issue to do with deen, maybe sometimes it's just a clarification of a verse of a Qur'an. So which is the commentary and the exegesis of the Qur'an. Somebody might say, I don't understand this particular verse or this line or this word. Can you provide an explanation? Or what does this particular hadith, the statement, the prophetic statement, what does it mean? Or is this particular hadith, uh, which is the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessings be upon him, is it an absolutely rigorously authenticated one or not? Can you check the chain for me? Can you rigorously authenticate the chain? So it could be any matter related to the person's faith, whether it's something practical, whether it's something based on that person's belief, or whether it's about some knowledge to do with the Quran and Hadith, etc. So that's, what, that's basically what a fatwa is. And then from that fatwa, we have the word mufti or a muftiya. Mufti is the one providing the response, and you have muftiya, which is a female version of the one who's providing the response. Uh, and we have the mustafti, who is asking the question, seeking clarification, seeking advice, etc. Now, the word mufti, as I just said, that the one who's responding or answering a question, but I want to mention one point here, that the word mufti can be uh, understood in three different ways. Classically, the word mufti was used for a person who we know as a mujtahid. Mujtahid is, is someone who has the tools 
due to that person's intense and deep knowledge and understanding of the sacred text. This person's deep understanding, he has the tools or she has the tools to extract and derive and uh, deduce laws, Islamic laws, from the sacred text. This was a mujtahid. So classically, a mufti was a, uh, a mujtahid. It was used for a mujtahid, somebody who had those tools. That's number one. In current times, the term mufti is used in two, two senses. In most parts of the world, mufti is state appointed. So if you go to the Arab world, uh, especially the Islamic countries, a mufti, there will be 40 people qualified to be muftis, but none of them will have the title mufti before their names. They'll just be sheikh or doctor. Yeah, we have Dr. Mansour, he's, he's a mufti as well. Anyone who, who, who has knowledge of fiqh, Islamic law, anyone, able to, anyone who is capable of re responding to questions based, of their, based on the knowledge of Islam is a mufti. So in, in the Islamic world, in the Arab world, the term mufti is given by the government. And sometimes it could be a government mufti as well, uh, where you issue fatawa and fatwa what, we, what the government likes. So anyway, that can happen. But um, it's a state appointed. So you might have three muftis state appointed of the country, and then there's a grand mufti. Whereas in the subcontinent, like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, these countries, the system is slightly different. Whereas if a student studies, studies the basics, every student will study uh, the basics of becoming a religious scholar. They will start off six, seven, eight years, depends on the curriculum. These are private institutions in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And many of these institutions now we have in England, uh, which are predominantly based on the same pattern because most of the Muslims, majority, uh, especially since the 70s and 60s, are the Muslims who came from the subcontinent. So they have a lot of these institutions known as Dar al or whatever you want to call them, uh, and they have the same system. So it's like a system where you study six, seven, eight years. That's the basic study course where you start off with the basic Arabic language, grammar, um, sort of syntax, grammar, and um, uh, then you move on to some other topics. You study usul uh, al-hadith, usul al-fiqh, which is the principles of Islamic jurisprudence, principles of hadith, and you, you study the Quran translation, the meanings, the commentary of the Quran, and then you go on to study the six books of hadith in detail, all of that. And thereafter, you go into special, specialization, just like in a university degree, postgraduate degree, you go into a special, uh, you specialize in a particular field. So there are students that after st completing those six, seven, eight years, it depends, some places seven years, some places eight years, um, based on, I mean, in, in the UK, it's mostly about six, six years or seven years. You have a choice or an, op or an option to specialize in a particular field or area. So somebody might say, I want to go and specialize in hadith sciences. So that person will dedicate two years to the specialization of hadith sciences. So a mufti would be someone who would go and specialize, what we call takhassus, specialize in the science of Islamic jurisprudence, Islamic law. So it's all about halal and haram. It's all about do's and don'ts. Islam is not just about do's and don'ts, but it is a lot about do's and don'ts, like many other faiths. Islam has the legal Islamic rulings, like externally what you can do, you can't do, and there are also internal laws. And also Islam is about spirituality. It's a, it's a whole comprehensive way of life. So therefore, uh, it's about what a Muslim is allowed to do, and what a Muslim is not allowed to do. And then, of course, within that, you have differences of opinion, different schools of thought. You have the Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanbali, the four major legal Islamic Sunni schools of Islamic law. And then the non-Sunni ones you have, like the Zaydiyya and others. So anyone, any student who graduates, graduates from this specialization course of two years or three years, again, it could be two, it could be three, the third year, and I will mention about me, I've been told, I don't like to talk about myself, but Dr. Mansour sent me a long email saying, this is about you, in capital letters. Talk about yourself, who you, who you are. I said, I'm a human being. Somebody came to a companion, Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said, who are you? He said, ma ana illa min al I'm just a man from the normal believers. So, but anyway, because he emphasized, I might have to, I don't like to blow my own trumpet, and, and neither is there anything to blow anyway. So, um, I will talk about what I did, but just this is just a brief introduction, and uh, I know time is short. But 
I just wanted to mention this, that in the uh, current times, uh, this is how the term mufti is used. So therefore, within Muslims, like I was once traveling uh, somewhere um, to one of the Arab countries, and there was a, I think there was a Syrian, uh, I studied in Syria for a while, there was a Syrian friend of mine, uh, uh, so he said to me, and I get this question sometimes from non-subcontinent Muslims, who gave you the title mufti? Which, which, uh, which, which you know, president appointed you the mufti? Did, did uh, you know, t uh, the prime minister or the president of a Muslim country or, or David Cameron, did he phone you and say you're a state mufti of England? Uh, I get those questions. So then I have to explain that, look, this is just a metaphorical way. This is a subcontinent thing because my background is subcontinent, uh, even though uh, I was born here and I studied in the Arab world as well. But because of that aspect, anyone, and that's why you just mentioned Mufti Bilal, uh, Bilal I think, yes. So you have like hundreds of people with the title Mufti. It's anyone who just studies that two, three years of specialization course. Whereas in the Arab world, you could have 400 people studying the same course, uh, but nobody has the title of Mufti before their name. It's only someone who is appointed by the government. So it's not a problem. It's just like a, a difference of, of maybe lands or areas. So classically, it was a mujtahid. In the current times, you have the Arab and the Islamic world uh, understanding of the term mufti and the subcontinent understanding of the word mufti. So I thought, let me just clarify that. And the word mustafti in Arabic means the one who's asking the question. In the hadith, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he actually said in one hadith that istafti qalbak, ask, seek fatwa from your heart. Actually, the greatest mufti in Islam is someone's heart. Because al-ithmu ma haka fi sadrik. The sin or something which uh, is considered to be uh, unlawful in Islam, the definition of a sin according to the prophetic hadith is that which causes uh, uneasiness in your heart. So 80% of the times anyone with a sound-hearted, uh, sound-natured heart will realize themselves morally, ethically what is right and what's wrong. You don't need to go and ask a mufti, oh, can I, can I do a scam or, you know, uh, can, I, can I cheat the system or can I do some fraud? I mean, 80, 60, 70, 80% of the laws everybody knows themselves. Maybe sometimes people only go to ask when they know it's maybe haram, but let's just find someone who might. You know, so we get away with it, but it, it doesn't work like that. We don't, if we know it's wrong and you know, we think we, that's it, on the, you know, in the next life, when God asks us, we'll just say, you know, this person told us, so it's off my back. So uh, the, the greatest mufti is actually the heart. It's tafti qalbak. Before going on to mentioning some of the things that how I work or any mufti works in, in, in modern day Britain, there's a, there's a difference between a mufti and a qadi. You have two terms. You have mufti, qadi. Qadi is a judge. So you have ifta, which is uh, the, 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 the act of providing religious rulings. And you have qada, which is the judiciary system, uh, a court of law. Now, the difference between the two, even classically and even in Islamic countries, you have a mufti and you have a qadi. So you go to, for example, uh, any Muslim country, go to Kuwait or go to Bahrain or go to Saudi Arabia. I don't like to use the term Saudi Arabia for that country, but anyway, it's called Saudi Arabia. Uh, or whichever of these countries, you'll have a mufti and you'll have a qadi. So qadi is the judge who's sitting in the court. The difference between the two positions or the two, uh, 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 two positions or the two types of work, you have fatwa and you have qada, so you, and the mufti and the qadi, is that a mufti provides a non-binding ruling. He or she just provides the questioner with the religious ruling about the particular matter, but does not enforce it. The qadi is an enforcer, so that's his role. He will have to enforce it. That's one difference between the two. The second difference is that the judge, the qadi, when the case or the scenario comes to his court, that qadi will have to sort of uh, get to the bottom of the case, he will bring in witnesses, he will ask for witnesses. The mufti doesn't need to do that. Like many times questions come to me, if it's a marital dispute, the wife will come or she'll call and she'll talk. And she'll talk a lot about her husband, but I'm not going to try to find out is it true what she's saying about her husband. She could be wrong, and, and many times she, she's probably exaggerating. Uh, everyone exaggerates. Sometimes the husband's exaggerating. I mean, everyone exaggerates. Every time, you know, I've only had one case where, out of hundreds of cases where somebody phoned in, it was actually a woman, she, she actually said, I have marriage problems, but it's all my fault. 
It's only once out of hundreds of cases. All the times, like the husband saying, uh, yeah, yeah. I know I have some faults, yeah, yeah, but, and then the list starts like, his, she's like this and she's like that, but she does this and she does this, and the wife is saying, yeah, I'm not an angel as well, yeah, yeah, but, and then the big, everyone blames the other party. So um, this is what happens. So we don't need to bring, ask them for witnesses or what you're saying is right. The answer is like, if what you are saying is the truth, then this is the correct ruling. If you, what you're saying is not the truth, then this is not the answer. We don't provide them with a the second sentence, but it's always, the answer is always, it starts with, in the asked situation, in the, question, in the situation that you've asked about, based on the uh, facts that you have provided, if what you have provided in your letter is true, then this is the Islamic verdict. Now, whether it's true or not, that's up to you, and you know, it's, so sometimes the answer may be not really a correct answer for the person to take away with because they have not provided with the correct details. So this is the difference between the qada and the fatwa system or a mufti and a judge. Um, uh, and also there's a third difference, but uh, we don't have time to go into it. But it basically it's this small difference, which is that the judicial system, the qada system, the qadi is only deals with uh, issues to which are, uh, you know, basically external laws which are to do with disputes, uh, and has no connection with things like belief system. Whereas the Mufti, as I mentioned in the beginning, he will receive a question about anything and everything from A to Z, from dream interpretations to, to you know, what shall I read when, 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 when I get scared or, you know, I'm shivering so much or, you know, anything. Or like someone says, somebody sent me a, a message the other day saying, I want to get married and I want to get married now, please help. He's like, Sheikh, I want to get married and I want to get married now, please help. What can I do? Okay, you know, subhanAllah. So um, it's anything. Anyway, so that, that's basically a brief intro to, to the uh, to work. Now, I, there's no time, but I want to talk about two other things, but I think I'm going to miss them. One was that this is a very uh, sort of uh, a very delicate position to be in Islamically. Uh, the, it's a very prestigious place, but as with any position, like you can, you know, maybe relate to it, or any position, being a director of an institute, being uh, an imam, or being a scholar, being a doctor, being a medic, with position, with authority, with the territory, responsibility comes about. And this is why this is an, um, a very delicate type of situation to be in Islamically. Reason being is because you, as a mufti or a muftiya, you are basically uh, in between a person and their god, uh, this is not like, you know, Islamically we don't have, like you don't need to get to God through someone, but this is just like you are actually, like Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim, one of the great scholars said, Al-Mufti Mu'aqqi'un Anillah. He is a signatory on behalf of Allah. It's like you are actually telling the person, they, are, they have trust on you that this is what God wants. The only reason they're trusting you is because they think that this is what you are saying is what God really wants from them. Uh, and and you know, this is the only reason. They don't want to know you as a person. They want. They they are only asking you because they trust you in in expounding or clarifying or explaining what God wants. So it's a very pre prestigious place. But um, we find classically, like some of them said, that uh, a a scholar of Islam, a mufti, is between God and his creation. So he should be very careful how he gets in between uh, making mistakes. You know, there's hadiths like. Whoever asks a question, uh, if without knowledge and the conditions, the person gave the fatwa or the religious ruling, then the sin is not on the person who took away the wrong ruling. The sin is on the person who provided the wrong ruling. So there's cases where sometimes a mufti can make a mistake. Like I know one of my teachers, he, he was... You know, and there's conditions like a mufti should not be ans answering questions when he's in an imbalanced state, when you're really hungry, when you're really thirsty, when you're really sad, or when you're really happy, because you could, you know, your mood or your imbalance in your in your nature may affect you and your providing of the correct ruling. So there was one sheikh who actually his father passed away just two three years, uh, two three days after that, and somebody on the street asked him a question, and then he. After he gave the answer, it was an answer to do with divorce, and he actually said uh, the divorce did not happen, or it happened, and it was vice versa, the correct ruling. Uh, and then he realized, oh, what did I do? And then he actually had to f try to search. It took him two weeks to find where this person is, 
because he is so fearful that I have provided a wrong ruling. He has taken away that ruling. He's going to act upon it, and I will be questioned on the Day of Judgment, and God will ask me about this, not him. So he actually literally, for two weeks, he said, I could not even eat. Uh, you know, my conscience was such that it was so difficult because I had to find this person. Where is he? Because sometimes that's why in the middle of the road, it's disliked or it's not recommended to provide rulings because how can you get back to that person? And this is why we have now proper, you know, uh, organizations, which I may just talk about briefly. So it's a very prestigious place to be in. There's, there's examples like earlier on that people like Imam Malik, who was asked sometimes 48 questions, about 32, he said, I don't know. There were, there's examples in the time of the, just at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the Sahaba, the companions, that people would just delegate the question, don't ask me, ask him. He, he goes to somebody else, ask her, so ask someone else, ask someone else. Uh, so they were very, very fearful about it. But moving on, just quickly, um, like Dr. Mansour said, this is about you. So what I did was how I studied. I studied, started off like he did as well, and many others, which is the basic study. Uh, and I already pointed towards some things briefly, uh, where I mentioned that students study with the, they start with the basic course of being a scholar. These are private in in institutions uh, in, the Brit in Britain. Uh, in, in the Arab world, they are recognized. In Britain, some places they may be recognized, maybe to, to uh, an extent it could be a BA degree, or some places uh, it could be an equivalent to an MA, it depends. There are some, some Places where, like Markfield, for example, they, they sometimes, if, if they see that if, if there's uh, quality and the caliber is there, they, they could take it to an equivalent to an MA. But it's a six, seven, eight year study. But basically before that as well, like for example, myself, I started from a young age. Um, uh, my father is a scholar and he's, he's originally from India and, and uh, he's been an imam, he's in his 70s for many, many years in Leicester. Uh, so basically, I since I you know opened my eyes, the only thing I've seen in my home is like st study and Islam and people memorizing and scholars are coming and it's just and this was in you know of course before 9/11, so it was very easy at that time to to you know some of the things which we t used to take for granted at that time. Um, I memorized the Quran at a very young age. Now when it, when it's child is young, what normally happens in many, many of these institutions is because you're a young child, you don't really understand anything, but you just memorize, basically. So it's because you, 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 know, you are young, and you have a sharp memory, and you're able to memorize. So I actually started memorizing the whole Quran, which is in Arabic. I started actually when I was six, and I completed that memorization when I was nine. It took three years. So at the age of nine, I completed the memorization of the Quran. But that doesn't mean I've understood anything. It's just like part fashion. You know, it's like, just absolute parrot fashion. Then later on, when you start studying, then what you've memorized earlier on when you were young, you start studying. And I went to an institution here in, in England, and I studied the basic seven-year course where I talked about the hadith and where the teacher teaches, and, and you take the knowledge and the explanation. You learn the Arabic language and Islamic jurisprudence and the principles of jurisprudence and hadith and all the different different topics. Uh, the six books of hadith, Hidayah, which, have, which is a very, very, Hidayah has been actually translated into English, a very uh, important book of Islamic jurisprudence, Islamic law, uh, non-Muslim, who translated Hidayah? Some, James Robson, I think? Hamilton. Hamilton, yes. He translated Hidayah, which is uh, and not the complete entire Hidayah. He, he just translated commercial law because when, when, uh, uh, when India was a colony and, and that time they wanted to know what the Islamic law states, so he actually translated uh, parts of Hidayah, which is commercial law, uh, penal law, not, not worship and pray and all of that because it was in the court system. So you study all of that. One of the, one of the most difficult books, I actually I teach that at the moment, even just this morning I had a small lesson on Hidayah, which is in Arabic. Uh, and we, it's a bo book in Hanafi jurisprudence. I will talk about this because then you have four law, uh, Sunni schools of Islamic law. So Hidayah is a very important book in the Hanafi school of Islamic law. And just like that, we have major books in the Shafi'i or the Maliki or the Hanbali. After that, I studied and I went to do, uh, I uh, carried on and I took that specialization course 
تخصص الفقه أو فتوى أو إفتاء where basically you you've already studied Islamic jurisprudence but now you get a practical training. I actually went to Pakistan. I studied two years. Some of you may have heard of uh, uh, a scholar, a world-renowned scholar. Uh, he's actually he was a judge as well. He uh, he has a degree in law, in economics, and many other aspects. A world-renowned scholar, Justice Mufti Taqi Uthmani. Uh, Islamic finance, you may have heard of him. He was a, uh, on the Sharia board of uh, Amana and many others, and he still is on many, many boards. Uh, he's still alive. May Allah preserve him, protect him. He's close to 70s. I met him last week. I think I was in Abu Dhabi, and I met him there. He was at an international conference. Uh, he's been teaching there for 40 odd years. This is actually one of the books that he wrote. It's in Arabic. This is called Usul al Ifta wa Adabuhu, The Principles of Fatwa and Its Etiquette. We actually studied this book with him. Um, so I studied there in Pakistan. Um, and in that course, what basically happens is you are getting and receiving, not just him, but there's many other teachers, you are receiving practical training of how to respond to questions. So what you learned in theory over the past six, seven years, you now put that into practice. So they have a massive Darul Ifta. Darul Ifta is the institute where, I mean, it's a massive place, but a, a section is Darul Ifta where they re receive two, three hundred queries per day, whether it's postal, whether it's uh, online, or people coming personally. And they have like 20 muftis. There's two people just, their job is from nine to five on the phone. So like, Salamu Alaikum. Yes, yes, yes. Salamu Alaikum. Okay, speak to a person for 10 minutes. Put it down. Salamu Alaikum. It's like nine to five. I've seen that. Like two people, that's their job. Uh, three people, their job is just to talk to people who come personally. Uh, there's a few who just take letters. There's a few just on email. Um, and there's, you know, head muftis there as well. So there's a whole section of, it's, it's a very busy place. Uh, so that's where students get practical training. So now when the questions come, they basically give these questions to the students. So you start off with the diff easy ones. So in the first few months, like if I offer my salah, my pray I am praying, and if, if I make a mistake, or if I sit down instead of standing up, what shall I do? Simple questions. Then as your training goes more, and, and they are checked by the teacher. They are not given back to the questioner until they're not checked and, and approved by the mufti, who are the qualified muftis, who, who have been given stamp by their teachers. So you, you carry on with that. Then you might get some more complex questions, like the ones on business, trade. There might be something to do with the banking system, something to do with divorce, marriage, inheritance. As the second year, you get more complex, and this is the practical training of how to respond to questions. Whilst you're studying, until then, you, you cannot, um, uh, every question that you will respond to, you will, it will be approved and stamped by the muftis there. So they will stamp it, they will approve it sometimes, they will, you will write an answer. Now this answer, how do you write this answer? Basically, uh, there are reference books. Uh, some questions, they will, ha they, will, they will require simple answers. Like for example, if somebody's asking, that can I, can I uh, drink alcohol? Who doesn't know from the Muslims that alcohol consumption is unlawful? So you just say, yeah, it is unlawful. It is not allowed in Islam. It is sinful. I once gave a lecture somewhere and <clears throat> somebody said, don't use the term sinful because sometimes some of the non-Muslims who are not accustomed to, uh, you know, what, in what context you're talking, it comes across like a derogatory word. So I tend to sometimes, when there's a mixed audience, avoid using the word sinful. It's, impermissible or it is not allowed according to Islamic law. Um, because sinfulness, it gives some sort of like it's immoral or dirty, maybe, you know, so it, anyway. So it is impermissible. But for that, you will just provide a reference from the Quran. The Quran says, this is a verse, chapter this, verse number this, this is what it says. But many of the times, it's not those type of questions. It's like, which is not clearly in the Quran, it's not clearly in the prophetic statement. Sometimes they may be just hadith, so you provide that. Uh, but you will go to the reference works of the particular schools. So if it's the Hanafi school, there are reference works in like eight volumes, 10 volumes, 12 volumes, 14 volumes, 30 volumes. And there's one book, al Mabsut, in 30 volumes. Actually, the author of that wrote two thirds of that in a well, at the top of his memory, uh, Imam al-Sarakhsi. He was, he was imprisoned by the, gov uh, the, uh, by the governor at that time. I think he was from right now, current day Tajikistan or Kyrgyzstan or somewhere, Kyrgyzstan. And he was actually imprisoned, house arrest, right in the bottom of the wealth. So he used to tell his student, come every day 
at the top of the well, and I'll dictate from here. And you write, and he's, so that I don't even waste my time here. And he's actually wrote two thirds of those 30 volumes with, from his memory, no reference books, nothing. Like, and he just dictated and he wrote, and the book's published, 30 volumes. Uh, so you have, uh, basically you refer to these books, you find what applies Many of the issues will be, you'll find clear rulings. Okay, you go to Radd al-Muhtar, which is a reference book in the Hanafi school. You'll find in the chapter of business and trade something which is clearly uh, providing a ruling for this person's question. Uh, sometimes it's modern issues, uh, like medical issues, or where you will not find someone, somebody wants to know about organ transplantation uh, or blood donation. So you will not find clear explicit rulings. For that, you have later books. Now, scholars from in 70s, like I said, they've been responding to new and new issues. There's international Islamic fiqh academies, like there's one in Jeddah in Saudi, based in Saudi Arabia. It's international board of scholars from throughout the world, and they've discussed, they've had seminars and discussions and debates on organ transplantation and blood transfusion and, and um, shares and bankings and everything, basically. So you have that as well material. You look at that material. In, in the subcontinent, you have like 12, 15 volumes of books where they've published of question and answers. So you have chapters where people are asking questions, answers, question, answers. So you look in there. Basically, it is most of the work is already done. You just, as a scholar, you just have to find and look at your context and see if the context is the right context. That's the art. The context is the right context and then provide that religious ruling. Sometimes you could disagree based on the context, etc. So uh, uh, th that's what I did there. And then afterwards, I actually went to study Syria after that, where I did a bit of comparative fiqh. And I was doing some other things besides you know, just fiqh. I was just improving my Arabic and a few other things, and just having a holiday as well, and just traveling around. And I went to a lot of Muslim countries, Jordan and uh, Syria. May Allah bring peace to that land. Uh, and uh, many, some other countries I went to just to study, right? <laughs> Nothing else. <laughs> you have to be very careful. Today, you have to just clarify everything. Um, so I went to Egypt, where you, went, you studied as well. I went to Yemen, just to study, OK, just to study, just to see, and just travel and see the different, different institutions. And actually, ni nice holiday. Um, briefly now, just a couple more points. Uh, what are the means of people asking a mufti question? Before, it was just uh, people used to send letters, post. But now we have all different means. Um, poster letters, like I particularly right now, I have a, like an institute known as Darul Ifta. It's online as well, darulifta.com. Some of you may have heard of it. Maybe controversially, some of you may have heard of it. And I will just talk about that as well briefly later on in a few minutes. Um, but it's an institute. It's connected to our masjid. We have a madrasa. We have like uh, different aspects. There's a school, you know. Uh, we have a school there, so academic studies are, uh, are studied as well. Uh, but this is just one department, which is just where I am at. So um, I also do teaching and some other things. But with this institute, I'm there a few hours every day, three, four hours a day, where if somebody wants to come and see me, right, they will book in an appointment. Uh, they will call and say, OK, I want to come and see you next week, Wednesday, 11 AM. Yes, come down, no problem. Yeah, I'll give them some tea as well, provide some tea. Uh, biscuits, uh, and they'll sit down, they'll relax, and they want to ask a question. They might, it might be about divorce, it might be about marriage, it might be about their dispute with their father or with their business colleague or whatever, or it could be about anything, just simple. They want to know what does Islam say. So I will provide the ruling. Uh, sometimes it's just an advice, sometimes it's a proper Islamic legal ruling. So personally people come. Um, uh, Nowadays also, many people call as well. So I, I have a, actually, I have for many years, for the past seven, eight years, I've specified two hours every single day for phone, phone calls. So 2 to 4 PM. Every, before, in the, a few years ago, it used to be in the evenings. And actually, at the evening times, a lot of people used to call. But now it's in the daytime. So now only the serious ones will call, because they will take time out from their work. <laughs> before it was 6, 8, it's like, you know, I was just sleeping, and I was just scratching my head, and maybe. I was wondering that, you know, on the moon, if somebody went on the moon and they saw, like, would they do tayammum on the moon or do ablution? And, you know, so it's just, now it's just a serious people. So 
um, two hours, and it's very busy. The line is very busy because I don't, from what I've been told by a lot of people, that there are not, not many services where it's just designated every single day, five days a week, two hours phone line. People call from all over, like not just in England. I have many calls. I've had calls from Brazil, from, from Uruguay, from Paraguay. Uh, from Argentina, I thought it was Messi calling me from Argentina, but he wasn't. Um, but from all sorts of parts of the world, even Pakistan. I said to the person from Pakistan, you've got scholars in Pakistan, why are you asking me? It's an Islamic country, why are you calling? But I thought he just probably wanted you to talk in English, practice in English maybe. <laughs> you know, in Pakistan, some people, they just like to talk in English, or they just feel that, oh, if it's someone in the West, they probably, you know, they're more, they might understand the issue better. Maybe the mullah here is probably backward. That's how it is in Pakistan and places like that. Anyway, from different parts of the world, and from Europe all the time, from Norway, Denmark, Sweden, it's just, and from here as well. Actually, most people are from outside Leicester, where I'm from, the court. Leicester people, very less. And that happens with most scholars and most imams. The people in your own community, they will, don't know this guy, it's just, you know, like they're saying, we've got a saying that someone within your own you know, they say in Urdu, Karki Murgi Dal I don't know, I don't know what that phrase is, how you'd say, is there an equivalent of that in English? Uh, anyway, it's like, you know, if someone, some in-house, something close to you, we don't value it. Not that they need to value me, anything like that, but just anything, when we have it close to us, we don't value it. So anyway, phone line, uh, People do, but I, I'm very strict with my mobile, so I don't give my number out to anybody because once before, when I used to give it out, I used to have phone calls at 1.25 a.m. So now, alaikum, okay, yeah, we're just thinking, we're reading something, I don't didn't understand something or something like that. Oh, can you tell me all the names of the people of, you know, in the, the people of the cave, you know, the, when they went, and you know, they had some names. We, we were just scratching our heads, there's a few friends here, we're just having some shisha, and we thought we'd call you 1.25 a.m. Come on, I have a life, you know? Uh, so therefore, things like that, you know, it's just, Random, ridiculous questions sometimes you get as well. But f phone calls, now social media, Facebook, Twitter, people, people tweeting me. How can you give a fatwa in 140 characters? <laughs> I actually tweeted. I said, it is impossible to give a fatwa in 140 characters. You can't. I mean, you'll misunderstand what I'm saying. So I have a very strict policy. It's tweeting is just for just social advice and just, rela you know, Facebook and Twitter is just for just, just general stuff, nothing you know, hardcore religious law, basically. It's just simple things um, about just social life, etc. So, but people ask via Facebook numerous, especially since I started my Facebook page, every day there's about 15 messages in the inbox from different parts of the world. This question, that question, this question, even though I've put a template that fiqh questions, fatwas will not be answered on this Facebook page. For that, go to the website. But still, I don't know if people read that or not. I don't know, it's just, they don't read that, they still ask. Um, so, uh, so from all different ways, and also personally, somebody might just meet you in the road, like imams as well. You know, I've had people asking me fatwas in Tesco. It's <laughs> like I'm buying some milk, and you know, it's, oh yeah, well, I just remember right now. It's, Come on, I'm buying milk here. I've got a life. I need to go home. You know, can you please? My hands are freezing. I've got two cold bottles of milk. You know, uh, is it, sometimes you have to be. You have to be polite. It's, it's a very testing type of situation. You have to decline and refuse in the politest of ways. Sometimes it's very difficult because uh, people sometimes, when they call you, they'll call you. You know, if they miscall you, once this person miscalled me like 27 calls. I was, I was busy. I think I was praying or something, and my phone was on my bed. And then 27 times, when I went, looked, it was 27 from the same number. <laughs> same number. I like twice, once, then of course the person's busy. There are etiquettes. People don't, sometimes don't f follow those etiquettes. Anyway, so this is the means. Um, and then there's two, uh, two ways of giving fatwa, or the mufti works, basically. Now, this is where, come, where when, uh, the online issue comes. I have a website, darrata.com, and there's, uh, I'll give you examples as well, but there's different topics um, uh, where, regarding which I've provided. But... Um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that. Uh, uh, the, the role, I, don't, I was going to say something, but I've just, it's gone from my mind. I'll probably come back again. Um, the, the role of a mufti is basically this, that this person has to ask, answer questions in every aspect of the person's life. Like I said, worship, purity, belief, so different, different aspects. Yeah, what I was going to say was I have this online website. 
Now, there's two types of fatwas. Some are specific to the person's question. So if the person comes and asks that, look, this is my situation. I want an Islamic distribution of the estate. How is an Islamic distribution of an estate? How does it take place? So he will say, my father passed away, uh, and there's my mother. I have a, two brothers. I have two sisters. I have aunts, uncle. These are the people. This is how much he left. He left this property, another property, this much in cash. Well, how do you divide it? So now you give a private answer. Those answers I will never put. Besides the one I have online, I have hundreds of private answers going, which are short to the point the person doesn't even need evidences. So he, you don't need, he trusts you. He's coming to you, he trusts you. You just tell him what, is, what the answer is. This is how it's divided. Or this is what happened. Is this a divorce Islamically or not? And you give a private answer, and the guy's happy, and he goes away. Online are general answers. So this is a general fatwa. And that's why I actually don't like to term my general uh, fatwas as fatwas. And that's why on the website, after a few years, I actually changed it to latest 10 articles or latest 10 answers because they are not specifically fatwa as such. They don't follow the guidelines of fatwa because you don't need to give you know every scenario in a fatwa. It's very specific. But these are answers. So because it's general, so I try to cover every aspect, the first scenario, the second scenario, the third scenario, the fourth scenario, all the evidences, Quranic verses, hadiths, and this is where the challenge comes in that I also try to mention the four schools of law. So like this is the Hanafi opinion, this is the Shafi'i opinion, this is the Maliki opinion, this is the Hanbali opinion, this is their evidences, this is their evidences. So from whichever angle, it's like a, like a research article and it takes time. Some of them are 10 pages long, some are 20 pages long. And people can read, that, uh, read them. I used to write a lot before when I wasn't too busy, but now it's very difficult to write all these long, long articles. And I'm not getting paid for them as well. If I was, then I would still be writing, but I don't, you know. So uh, this is why scholars and imams, when they do work, it's like, you know, a lot of it is voluntary. Like, you're, you don't have a nine to five job. Like I said, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, it's all voluntary. You're doing social advising. You're a counselor. You're a social advisor. You're, you're, you're someone just, a, you're sometimes a mufti is just, uh, you know, like a, an ear to listen to, like some, especially sisters, like just want to talk to you for 20 minutes and just, they just feel better after that. Rather than talk to a friend, they've to, spoken to an imam. They'll just feel better because they've taken off all the problems of their heart. So we just have to be a listener. So these are the different roles of a mufti, basically. A social advisor, good listener, uh, and every different aspects. Now, finally, the challenges, and this is very important, there's a few challenges of a mufti in this current 21st century or in, in the modern times, whatever, in, in especially specifically in the West, but wherever in the world. Um, the first challenge, I feel, is that because times have changed, uh, times meaning, of course, we, uh, time keep, times keep on changing. It was different 300 years ago. It's different now. And specifically because of, you know, the current climate after 9-11, one of the greatest challenges is that uh, okay, I'll mention that as the fourth challenge. But the first basic channel is that a uh, challenge is that because things change and they evolve, uh, technology-wise, etc., the mufti has to be very well aware and acquainted, and uh, uh, he needs to be quite uh, deep in his understanding of current affairs, uh, and especially the time, the country, or the place where he's living in. This is very important. There's a great saying of one of the great imams of the Hanafi school. His name was Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hassan. He used to say, he said, Whoever doesn't know about the context of his time, he is actually an ignorant person despite having the knowledge of Islam. He used to actually go into the marketplace and just sit there with the traders for five, six hours and just watch how people trade, what are their habits, so that when he is able to understand the context of people's issues and problems. So, that's one of the important challenges, to understand the current context and the country you're living in, what kind of background people are coming from, what they are accustomed to, what they are used to, what they are seeing, what, how they feel. And this is why one of the greatest responsibilities of a mufti or an imam or an Islamic leader or an Islamic advisor or, a, or an Islamic teacher is to put themselves in the shoes of the questioner before answering the question. So like if I was on that side, like you go on that side and sit there and see, like if I was in that kind of difficult situation, employment problems, you know, difficult em employment issues right now going on and, and you know, tough times and the cost of living, et cetera, et cetera. So be in that stage and then try to respond to the question. So that's a very important challenge. Second, number two, is that he needs to provide 
a very important responsibility and challenge is to provide an alternative. So it's not just about saying, okay, this is what Islam says, unlawful, this is lawful, unlawful, lawful. No. The responsibility is actually to provide an alternative where you can provide an alternative. You can't have an alternative for everything. You can't say, okay, this is alcohol, so don't drink you know, whiskey, but here's brandy. No. Of course, sometimes there's no alternative. Maybe you could say just have Red Bull. I don't know if that's an alternative. But um, providing alternative, you, this line of job is not permissible according to Islamic law. Maybe if you tweak this and if you change this or if you try it this way, then this becomes halal. So that's a very, very difficult challenge, very difficult challenge. Uh, number three, just a three, four, and five, and then inshallah I'm going to end. Uh, the mufti needs to understand the needs of the people because you know, uh, when there's difficulties and hardships, we have a principle in Islamic jurisprudence which is agreed upon uh, that uh, necessities make prohibitions lawful. So if somebody is dying out of hunger, they could eat pork Islamically. Somebody is dying out of thirst, not just that they could, they must, otherwise it's suicide and you become sinful for not eating pork. You become sinful for not drinking alcohol if you're thirsty and there's no other drink. So the situations of need and necessity to, to determine whether that person is in that situation of absolute dire necessity or need, so maybe he could get something which is illegal, I mean Islamically impermissible and lawful, can it become permissible in this case for this person? So that's a very important challenge for a mufti. And finally, this point is very important. I'm going to end with this point. That um, a lot of times when, uh, because there's a big challenge for just generally for anyone speaking about Islam, not just a mufti and not just an imam, but anybody. Uh, and, and the challenge is that we have a lot of these so-called blogs and bloggers and people just writing you know, all sorts of whatever they want to write. But it seems that sometimes anyone who is talking anything about Islam in any context, there's always an attack. And the reason for that is that sometimes it's misunderstood. It's like, okay, this sheikh or this imam or this mufti or is, not, is, is violating women's rights or is violating these rights or that right. And there's a misunderstanding. What's happened is that like any other faith, Christianity, Judaism, Islam is no different. Every faith has do's and don'ts, laws. So like, for example, in Judaism, you know, there's certain things you can do, certain things you can't do. Actually, there's more strict laws in Judaism than even Islam. So like, for example, stunning an animal before uh, slaughter, actually, in Judaism, it's haram, it's sinful, okay? It's, they don't use the term haram, but it's sinful, it's not allowed, and, and the meat becomes impermissible. Likewise, in Islam, it's the same ruling. So there are do's and don'ts. Now, anyone who takes on a faith, no, it's, it's, they've taken on that faith themselves, nobody's forced them, and there's no force in Islam for anyone to take on any faith, and neither is there any force on anyone to act upon any faith. It's purely between that person and their Lord. If they want to themselves, want to practice on Islam, or Christianity, or Judaism, and they come to a scholar, or a bishop, or a, a rabbi, or whoever, what does our religion say about this particular thing? Because I want to act upon what my religion says then the scholar or the mufti is just providing a ruling. So for example, um, if somebody comes and asks a mufti uh, about inheritance issues, the Quran says inheritance, uh, the male receives two shares and the female receives half. I mean, there's wisdoms behind it. And that's why another challenge today is because of post 9-11, everything we have to, before in the early times, you would just have to say this and that's it, stop. But now we have to explain the wisdom because to be politically correct, because of the atmosphere. So why is it two and not, you know, why is it double than the female? What's the reason? What's the wisdom? Is it it's because the husband has to provide and, and the wife? All the wisdom and everything, even for Muslims, because Muslims, you know, uh, are living in, in, in a climate where they are being challenged. So everything requires a lengthy, detailed explanation, all the wisdoms and the reasoning behind it and why this ruling has been given. So um, when a religious ruling is being given, this is not, it's not enforcing anything on anyone. So for example, if, and as we said, that it's, there's every topic. So somebody might come uh, to ask a question about, say this brother comes and asks a question, uh, to a mufti, he'll come to ask me, do I have to wake up in the morning and offer my fajr prayer? Fajr is the first prayer for those who uh, don't know, which is 4.30 a.m. As a mufti or an imam or a doctor or a doktor, like in Arabic, he would say, yes, you have to. What, about, what if I don't wake up and I don't pray? 
you will be committing a sin. According to the Islamic faith, it's a sin. You are violating the law, you are disobeying God. That's it. Okay, he walks away. Now, the Mufti doesn't now go and start checking, is he really waking up or not? You go, you wake up, you sleep, you wake up, you wake up at 12, 1 p.m. or whatever, that's you and that's got nothing to do with me. I have just told you that it is obligatory for you to wake up, but I am not enforcing anything on you. It's your private decision and it's your private choice. It's your personal choice. Now, if somebody turns around if, and says, Mm, this mufti is violating this person's international human right to sleep. <laughs> How absurd does that sound? Yeah. Exactly in the same way, if it's a matter of marriage, if it's women's right or anything, if you're giving a private ruling, because in those issues straight away, ah, just I read an article, these are basic human rights, you know, that the woman is getting, uh, receiving half a share of inheritance, basic human rights, violating human rights. Nobody's forcing it upon them. This is what I believe. If the questioner wants to take that as well, up to you. If you don't want to, not a problem. Likewise, like fasting. If somebody comes and asks me, do I have to fast in the month of Ramadan? Yes. Can I eat? No. Until when? 8 p.m. You are violating my international human right to eat. I'm not violating. You eat, you can eat two plates of biryani and have donut kebab and chips and burgers and go McDonald's or whatever. Nothing to do with me. I, I can't change it. I can't say you can eat. I will have to say you can't eat, but whether you do eat or not, that's totally up to you. So if it's the same in prayer and fasting, likewise, if it's marriage, if it's divorce, if it's business laws, if it's inheritance, Whatever, everybody is free. They have basic human right to do whatever they want to do, but the mufti will only be providing what he thinks is an Islamic ruling. This is what I believe in, but you, there's no force or co uh, uh, compulsion on you to act upon it in any way, shape, or form. And because of not understanding this, we have a lot of this in the current media climate. And especially my website was quite a bit, it came on Panorama and a few other places, and it was attacked. And, and the reason was, and the reason is, is because what I've written on there, what I've said, every 80 to 90% of imams of the whole country would give you the same answer. But the only difference is, and every person's house has books, every scholar has a library of books, exactly what's written on my website, because I've taken it from the same books. But the only difference is mine's online and that's not online. So because there's a place online to find it, it's in the Quran. Sometimes it's, like for example, I'm, I'm finishing, I know you've given two minutes, but like for example, you know, one big issue is that uh, there's a hadith where the messenger, peace and blessings be upon him, said that uh, in a marriage, a woman must, must fulfill the sexual needs of her husband. If she doesn't, then the angels curse her. Okay. Now that was taken so much out of context, like, oh, there's basic rights, human, woman rights, like the man is maybe take a, you know, it sounds like, you know, he's going to take a gun or a, you know, like a bat or something. I say, you better, you know, do it or whatever. I'm going to sh shoot you, whatever. That's how it sounds. I had to put a clarification that, look, Islamically, men have sexual rights and women. Both parties are religiously obliged, both, the husband and wife. This is not just a man's right, this is a woman's right. I have cases where women are complaining about their husbands that they're not fulfilling our sexual needs. Many cases. Both of them are religiously obligated to fulfill. If they don't, they are sinful. If they're sinful, what does that mean? The sin is in the next life. Nobody's gonna do anything to you in this life. The sin is in the next life. If you have an excuse, not a problem. Islamically, if anybody has an excuse, then they're not sinful. If whether they have an excuse, they don't have an excuse, no, we're not going to judge them. It's between them and God in the next life. Nobody can force anyone in this life, basically. So this is how fiqh is understood, and it's misunderstood by many people, and that's why a lot of these controversies come up. But I'm just going to end, and sorry for going on a tangent maybe about this last topic, but inshallah, I hope this provides some guidance. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thanks a lot.